might be wondering, why is a British guy who's only lived in Hong Kong for three years and doesn't speak Cantonese speaking to a room of young Hong Kongers today about young people, Hong Kong, and identity? It's a pretty good question. And if you bear with me over the next few minutes, I hope to shed a bit of light into my journey and how I came to write this book about young people in Hong Kong. And also, I think, the value of outside perspectives, as well, perhaps, as some of the limitations. Let me start with a little bit about myself, the outsider, in this case, because I think it's important to understand my journey and should shed some more light on the people I've been talking to as well. So, I'm a foreign correspondent. I work for the Financial Times now, and I've been working in Asia for 10 years, uh, three years in Hong Kong, and before that I was based in Indonesia, Vietnam, and Singapore. What does a foreign correspondent do? It sounds kind of sexy. Some people think it's a bit James Bond-like. It's not like that at all, I can assure you. It's very hard work. I just got back from a week in Malaysia covering the amazing election there, which was fantastic, but very, very tiring. Um, so it, it's a strange job, because we basically turn up, as I did in, in Malaysia last week, in a place where often we don't speak the language. Actually, I, I did in Malaysia. But often we don't speak the language. We don't know many people in that place. We don't have much background knowledge. And we then try and explain that place we don't know to a bunch of other people on the other side of the world who don't know much or care much about that other place. It's, it's a very bizarre thing. But I think it's an important function that people like me play around the world, uh, not just Westerners in Asia, but Chinese correspondents in the US and Europe, trying to explain the US and Europe to Chinese audiences back home. Uh, and there are certain advantages and disadvantages that come with the job. I think in the negative column, of course, without specific language skills, without deep local contacts, without historical and cultural knowledge, a lot of foreign reporting can be quite shallow, unfortunately. But I think the, the big advantage, especially when journalists work hard to learn languages, to meet people, to understand the culture, is that you bring a fresh pair of eyes and an outside perspective to the story. And that hopefully adds value, not just to your readers in London or Tokyo or faraway places, but even in the place you're writing about. I know for me, I'm, I'm British. When I want to know what's going on in my country, I don't read the British press. I pick up the New York Times because they have a much broader comparative view on what's going on. And what I try to do in my book about Hong Kong, what I'll try and talk about today, is the advantage of these comparative perspectives in shedding light on complex issues. So first up, how did I come to write a book about Hong Kong and young people? It's, it's a very good question. And I want to take you back three years to how it happened. It was all about a flag. It was this flag. So three years ago, on June the 4th, it was a typically hot, humid night in Hong Kong. I was very sweaty, very unpleasant. And I'd gone to Victoria Park to report on the annual candlelit vigil to commemorate the people who were killed during the crackdown on the Tiananmen Square protest in 1989. It's a very moving event, it was my first time being there. Um, so I spent maybe an hour there talking to people and observing, and then a friend told me there was a counter-protest just over the other side of Victoria Harbor. So I hopped on the Star Ferry to go to Chim Tha Choi to go to this localist protest, as I learned it was called, where there was a group of mostly young Hong Kongers saying, we want democracy, we want to defend our rights. We don't want to fight for democracy for the whole of China, only for Hong Kong. So we're against those guys over there with the candles. We're fighting for our rights. Um, so I turned up there. There was maybe a few hundred people, not a big protest, uh, quite noisy. And not, not long after I arrived, I saw this group of young people waving this rather strange flag you can see here. I thought, this is a newcomer to Hong Kong. What's going on here? Why do you have some guys who are like high school students waving this weird British colonial flag. Um, as I mentioned before, I've previously been based in other former Western colonies around Asia. In Indonesia, it would be unimaginable to see high school kids waving the Dutch flag. In Vietnam, no, no Vietnamese kid worth their salt would wave the French tricolor. And of course, in Singapore, no one would wave 
the British flag. It would be, be unheard of. So being a journalist, I went up to these guys to try and talk to them. And then, even stranger, they barely spoke English. So you have a bunch of kids waving a British colonial flag in Hong Kong who don't speak very good English. Um, anyway, I persisted. Of course, it's my fault I should speak Cantonese. I can't blame them. I persisted, and um, once they relaxed a bit, they explained to me that, of course, they didn't want to bring back Chris Patton and the British colonial government, let alone the current British government, which many British people don't even want. Um, but they just wanted to stick two fingers up to China. This was a symbolic protest designed to say, we're fed up with being part of China. We want to defend Hong Kong. Um, so it was this very strange moment that sparked me to go on my journey to write a book about young people in Hong Kong. And partly that's because of my history. Uh, I studied the subject of history. Uh, I studied the development of nationalism in Asia, how all these many weird colonial empires were broken up into new nations. And I was fascinated by the idea of identity formation. And I could tell there was something very strange going on with identity when you have these kids going to be British, English waving the, the British flag here. So I proceeded to go on a journey through Hong Kong, talking to many different kinds of young people. I was particularly interested in millennials, partly because I'm just about millennial at 35. I'm at the upper, upper end of the range. Uh, and I thought there was something different about this generation. So I spoke to young political activists uh, across the spectrum from the likes of Joshua Wong and Agnes Chow to Edward Lowe, who was just convicted of rioting recently, and many people outside politics. I went to interview some of these super tutors who I'm sure helped some of you guys in the room pass your exams and earn millions of US dollars as a result. I spoke to some of the second and third generation kids of uh, the famous Hong Kong tycoon family, although unfortunately, uh, most of those guys didn't want to talk on the record. The only one I could find who did was Lam Ming Wai, uh, who's a member of the government's youth commission, quite an interesting guy. And I spoke to people in business and the professions, but all in this age range of sort of 18 to 35 uh, millennials. Um, and I came up with a name to describe this group, partly because when you're selling a book, you need a snazzy name, and partly because I think the name I came up with encapsulated some of the issues I'm talking about in my book. And the name was Generation HK. Um, why Generation HK? Well, I think the millennials in Hong Kong were the first generation, really, to come of age since the handover in 1997. Anyone from the age of 35, 36 to 18 well, they've either spent their whole life or their whole adult life after the handover in this very strange period of time. I think Hong Kong has always had identity questions hanging over it. As a British colony before and now as part of China, there's this cliche about Hong Kong being a borrowed place on borrowed time. I think there's definitely some truth into that. And this sense of identity has shifted, but I thought there was something unique about this uh, millennial generation uh, for a number of reasons, which, which I'll talk about shortly. And I think there are three main themes that really emerged from my conversations with a broad range of people. And obviously, some of these issues are very political, but I think people across the spectrum, from those who are sort of pro-establishment, pro-Beijing on the one side, to pro-independence on the other, broadly agreed that there were these sort of three themes that were driving many young people to think about who they were, not just in relation to China or Hong Kong's past, but also in relation to their parents, their peers, in relation to society. And I think Hong Kong is really in a unique place right now. It's you know people who have come of age since the handover have come of age in the shadow of the world's greatest rising power. Uh, so it's really a unique experience. And it's one that is of interest to the rest of the world because the rise of China is changing the whole world from Fiji to Florida. And in a way, Hong Kong is on the front line. So I think the experience here is of great interest to, to the outside world. Uh, and I think, obviously, great interest to, to Hong Kong is because it's all your future. Um, so I'll talk about my three main findings, if you like, briefly. Um, the first thing was of course, the Umbrella Revolution, the Occupy movement. And many people I spoke to across the political spectrum agreed that this was a moment of awakening for many young people in Hong Kong. 
There's this stereotype about Hong Kong, which I think holds within Hong Kong and outside too, that Hong Kongers are very sort of pragmatic, if you like. There's this sense that most people should stay out of politics, keep their head down, work really hard, find a corporate job, maybe lawyer or accountant, move up the corporate ladder, and maybe, if you're very lucky, one day afford a really tiny apartment somewhere. And you know, that's your job done. Then you procreate onto the next generation and the conveyor belt continues. Uh, you know, this stereotype is really strong, as I said, both inside and outside the city. And I think, for many people, the Occupy movement blew that stereotype up. It completely exploded it. And I think the government realized, actually, young people in particular aren't just going to do what they're told. They have their own views. And many young people I spoke to, from the famous activists to even other people. You know, I interviewed uh, someone from the insurance industry, an emergency room doctor. People who told me they'd never been political before in their life. They hadn't read political biographies. They didn't really know what the basic law was. They weren't interested in the Politburo and the workings of the Chinese Communist Party. But when they saw their friends, um, their colleagues out on the streets protesting for something that was bigger than them, that was about higher ideals, it was about the future of their city and their people, that sparked them to think, what is my role in this city? Where is the city going? And what can I do to try and change the direction of the city in the way in which I want it to go? And I think that was a very profound sense of the day across the political spectrum. Um, so that's the first thing, the umbrella movement was really a moment of political awakening across the city. And I think we've seen how fast political events have moved in the last three years here. And that's largely as a result of the, the umbrella movement. I think the next thing that emerged is really the pressure that a lot of people, and in particular young people in Hong Kong, face in terms of the space. Uh, you know, space here is really squeezed in a unique way that you just don't see anywhere else in the world. And I mean space in, in the broader sense, economic space, political space, social space, actual space. When you're walking down the pavement, when you're on the MTR, space in your apartment. Um, and I think there's a lot of pressure and young people feel it the most. That's partly because of economic shifts we've seen around the world, right? Uh, the baby boomer generation in Hong Kong and in many other cities around the world got the benefits of decades of economic growth, higher house prices, and the younger generation, including myself and in my home city, London, have been landed with really high housing prices at a time when graduate salaries, starting salaries are not moving up much, and the cost of living is really high. Um, so I think this, this pressure on the cost of living is not unique to Hong Kong. You see it in London, from Taipei to Tokyo, and Singapore to San Francisco. But what's unique in Hong Kong is the overlay of the political, social, and economic pressures because of the relationship with mainland China and the way, and that's, the way that's changing right now. So 20 years ago, Hong Kong was about a fifth of Chinese GDP. Today, it's just 3% of China's economy. The Hong Kong economy is the same size as Shenzhen and Guangzhou. And I think you see the complete reversal in the power relationship that's leading to a lot of pressure that makes many Hong Kongers, particularly young Hong Kongers, uneasy. And they somehow feel threatened in a way that, you know, elsewhere around the world right now, there are also debates about how the rise of China is affecting other places too. So it's not unique to Hong Kong, but it's unique in that Hong Kong is part of China and yet has a separate political system, uh, which is a kind of unique social and political experiment. Can a mostly free and semi-democratic city of 7 million people survive as part of the world's biggest authoritarian state? And then, I think this brings me on to my last point, which is about the identity vacuum in Hong Kong, which is, I think, what ties together these other issues I've been talking about. I mean, many people told me that when they grew up coming of age after the handover, they didn't really know who they were. I mean, their parents and grandparents, and I'm sure many of your ancestors, they'd been British colonial subjects to a certain extent. They'd also been emigrants from, from the mainland, or perhaps refugees from you know, many of the cases of economic and political turmoil that affected China over the, the previous hundred years. 
Um, but people who came of age since the handover were in, were in this vacuum. A lot of young people don't feel any connection to the British legacy, really. But they also increasingly feel a weaker connection to mainland China, too. And I think the rise of China has sort of exacerbated that, in a sense. And I think many people feel, young people feel their identity is both threatened uh, by the rise of China, but that also has an effect of reinforcing this identity in a strange way. And whenever you have a vacuum, it's filled by something very quickly. In this case, it's been the Hong Kong identity. And, and this Generation HK is the first generation that are first and foremost Hong Kongers. They don't think of themselves, I don't think, for the most part, as, as something else. Although, it, obviously, identity is a complex question, and there are many different identities we all have. But I think part of the issue is we all define ourselves against others. It's not unique. Hong Kong. British people define themselves often as not being French or German. Look at Brexit. Um, Scottish people definitely define themselves as not English, and they've been trying at least half of them to get independence for quite some time. Canadians definitely define themselves as not being Americans, and particularly so in the age of Trump. So it's not surprising in a way that young Hong Kongers at this uncertain time would define themselves against the mainland, but obviously that encapsulates a whole series of political, economic, and social challenges. And I think over the last three years, we've been on something of a roller coaster ride as young people and others have seen this, all these issues play out. I mean, for me, as a journalist covering Hong Kong, it's been really hard to keep up. I mean, first we had young people on the streets protesting, then some of them formed political parties and got elected to the Legislative Council. I mean, that's extremely rare elsewhere in the world. You know, there are many student protest movements, but normally those guys, once they finish protesting, they get their degree, they go and join an investment bank or an accounting firm and get on with their life. Well, these guys said, no, we're going to enter politics. And they convinced not kids, but adults to elect them. And then, of course, they got kicked out of the legislative council for various reasons. Some of them now prosecuted, sent to jail. And I think many of those young political activists are a bit lost now trying to work out the way forward. And I think outside observers, too, are kind of lost to understand where things are going. Uh, in writing my book, I haven't tried to provide any answers. I just want to raise and provoke these questions about identity, which I think are really important everywhere around the world right now, where we're all talking about identity politics. But I think they're really important to Hong Kong. And I think people outside are interested, because as I said earlier, Hong Kong is, in a way, a kind of case study of how the rise of China will affect the world around it. So I think it's a fascinating time. It's an uncertain time. I've tried to sketch out in my book a few modest thoughts and questions, but really it's up to young Hong Kongers, to all you guys here, to write the next chapter of this story. Thank you. <laughs>